So how do we ensure that all the condenser mics we buy are going to sound different? So that when that new singer comes in, or the lap steel player, or the mandolin player, or the hammer dulcimer, you know, or the cowbell, we have the mic that's right for that application. Well, the most important component in a condenser mic in determining what it's going to sound like is the capsule. This is a, a photograph of, the f of four of the most common um, large diaphragm condenser uh, capsule designs in the world. Um, they were all invented in Germany a long time ago, or Europe, I should say, a long time ago. And not every capsule is based on these. There are some companies that are doing innovative stuff. In fact, a bit ago we saw there was the Bach audio mic that has the sort of oval capsule that's a new design based on these, but new. And then even crazy different from that was the Audio Technica that was a two by two grid of rectangular capsules. Okay, again, very, very different, different sounding and, and, and peculiar in a bunch of interesting ways. But so anyway, left to right, uh, CK12 style. So this is an AKG design. It's uh, edge terminated. What does that mean? It means there's no bolt in the center. Okay, see that the other three up there, uh, they all have a screw right in the center of that diaphragm. And that's, and now, you know, we're not learning how to design capsules here. We're learning how to look at them and say, oh, I know what that is. Because part two of I know what that is, is I know what that sounds like. Why is that interesting? Because we're trying to figure out what they sound like before we hear them, right? So that when we're shopping, we can start to think, okay, I want one of these. No, that's probably too close to what I've got, etc. So we're picking up some simple visual cues here so we can distinguish these things. So the first one is the edge terminated design. There's no screw in the center. The next one, or the next three all have screws, but let's take a look at the, the fourth one, the M7. Uh, what's different about that, obviously? Well, there's no uh, big ring around the outside with screws in it, okay? So in these other cases, that is called a clamping ring, that holds that thin diaphragm in place, okay? The way these are made is that there's a piece of brass that's the back plate, and they lay the diaphragm on. It's been pre-tensioned. Then they put a, a ring on top, and they screw it down to hold it in place. Um, it's not like a drum. You don't tune it by turning the screws. There's no lip on there that it increases tension. That's a misconception that some people have. But, uh, uh, but in this case, the M7 is really interesting in that it's glued on. So the mylar is pre-tensioned and laid on top, and then you put pin pricks in it, and then you put uh, a, a tiny little micro drop of crazy glue inside. And there's these little ridges, little grooves that go around the circumference of the capsule, and the glue sits in that little trench and holds the diaphragm down if you're lucky. And if you, if you mess it up, you scrub it off and start over. And if you mess up the second side, then you take both sides off and start over. And I think that's why these aren't made as often anymore. I think they're fiendishly difficult to make. Um, anyway, easily distinguished visually, right? Because there's no big clamping ring full of screws. Now, the next thing to look for is a little more subtle. Uh, two things, actually. So. You can see the language on here, dual backplate, single backplate, et cetera. So what is the backplate? Well, that's the piece of brass that is the, the bulk of the capsule. You can see this one has no seam in the middle. You can see the two clamping rings because they're shiny. So those are the rings on the front and the back. But the backplate itself is one solid piece of brass, whereas this one's got a seam right through the middle. And it's hard to see on this one, but it's there as well. Okay. Um, so the K67 and the CK12 are dual backplate capsules. And uh, now, of course, you can distinguish the CK12 because it doesn't have a screw in the middle. But the way that you would distinguish these two um, is one of two ways. Uh, one would be that the K67 has two back plates, whereas this has a single. The second is the drilling pattern, and that's what the lower pictures are for. You can see the K47 has a ring of circles drilled in a concentric arrangement around the periphery of that gold center. You can't always see the, the, uh, the holes. It uh, depends on how large that metalized area is in, on the diaphragm. So that the top photo here, you can't see the, the holes very well. On this one, you can, but typically on the K67, you can see them, and you can see that this forms lines that are tangential to the circumference. Okay, So this pattern of six holes there, and then four holes, and then six, and then four, that is the K67 design. And chances are, if you own a large diaphragm condenser, and you take off the grill and you look inside, that's what you're going to see because that, again, is the most popular design in the world. So, what do these sound like? I keep saying that the capsule is the most important component in the mic, and that it largely determines the sound of the microphone. So here's what that looks like. The audible sound range typically is described as ranging from 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz. 
And that's what's pictured here. Um, 20 hertz would be here at the left side. Uh, I'm not sure this actually goes to 20. That's 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40. So this one starts at 40 hertz, um, up to uh, a, little bit, a little bit beyond 20 kilohertz. And, um, and so uh, if I had the world's most perfect microphone, and uh, in, the, in an anechoic chamber, and I had the world's most perfect speaker that could reproduce frequencies with utmost fidelity, and I put my perfect microphone in front of my perfect speaker in my perfectly anechoic room, and I played a sine wave that started at 20 hertz, which is a very, very low sound, um, all the way up to 20 kilohertz, which is higher than I can hear, <laughs> higher than probably most of you can hear as well, um, you'd get a flat line here, okay? The, the frequency response graph would be a flat line. Um, now, if you were to run that signal through your, uh, your home stereo and you were to crank up the treble control, right? Everyone's played with the treble control. It makes the music sound brighter and more open. Uh, what that line would look like is it would go up like this, okay? This is treble. An increase in treble looks like this, whereas an increase in bass would look like that. All right, so what this graph tells us, uh, oh, let me explain how I made this first. So, um, you know, the, the hard thing about testing microphones is that uh, to some small degree, everything matters, right? The body size, the body shape, uh, the constitution of the grill, right? The height of the capsule above the, the thing that it's standing on matters. The volume of the air cavity inside the grill matters. Um, in the Neumann U47, a very famous old microphone, uh, the capsule sits here and then it's inside the grill and the grill has a crossbar that's right across the top of the capsule. That matters. Okay, you can hear that. If you change the grill on that microphone, it won't sound like a U47 anymore. So all these things matter, at least in some subtle way. And, uh, and so I wanted to isolate the sound of the capsules apart from, um, apart from all those other factors. And so I, I built one microphone that had a linear frequency response, and then I put four different capsules in it. And that way the speaker was the same, the measuring distance was the same, the temperature and humidity, which matter, was the same because we tested them all right back to back and we plotted the results. And uh, let's start with the blue one, the CK12 replica. Uh, it's a bit exaggerated on the left side. That means it's bassier. It has more bass response than these other capsules. Um, and then you look at the top end, the, the right side of the graph for this blue line, there's a bump around 10 kilohertz. So it has some brightness as well. So this is what is sometimes described, uh, at least by me, as a smiley face EQ curve, right? It's a little bright on top and a little, a little bassy on the bottom. Um, what you'll find as you, as you get into um, you know, using microphones and certainly you know, measuring them and building them is that um, audio is, uh, the way we perceive audio uh, depends on relative volumes, okay? So this capsule doesn't come across as boomy despite having an exaggerated bass response and it doesn't come across as being bright or thin despite having an exaggerated treble response it sounds balanced and it sounds like it has a lot of detail because the highs and the lows balance out. All right, now let's take a look at the green line. This is the Neumann K67. Again, a very, very popular capsule, not meaning just the one that is made in Germany, but, uh, but the ones that are made worldwide. Um, they have a very exaggerated bright response. Not much happening in the bass, but a big bump, the biggest bump of all in that green line on, at the 10K point. Um, that actually, that green trace, that is the sound of most Chinese microphones. Um, the reason is that the Chinese factories, uh, when they started making pro audio gear, they were looking for an inexpensive way to do it because they're about mass market. And of course, the people who were hiring them to build these things were after low cost and high volume. And so the easiest way to do that was with uh, a circuit uh, that was designed in Germany by a company called Sheps. And it's a... Uh, an amazing circuit that is linear with respect to frequency, but more importantly, can be made with the cheapest parts in the world and still sound pretty good. So it's amazingly resilient to poor implementations. And you don't need an expensive transformer. Even bad transformers cost money, but a couple of bipolar transistors, that's like five cents, okay? So you can build a Shep style circuit for under a dollar probably at, at, you know, at volume. Um, but if you couple that circuit to the easiest in the world to make capsule, which is the K67, you end up with this green trace. And that is, that is the sound of inexpensive microphones. 
Um, now, in a, in a more reputable implementation of that capsule, you'd couple it to a circuit that's doing some EQ, corrective EQ, right? If your circuit EQ goes like this, it falls off, and your capsule goes like this, the combination sounds pretty good. It flattens out. That's what the, the U87 sounds like. That's the microphone that we saw at the beginning. And that's what most K67-based microphones sound like. So, so this uh, chart is not intended to suggest that every microphone sounds exactly like this. It's intended to describe what the capsule sounds like. Okay? Then let's look uh, at the red one, the K47. So this is uh, maybe the next most popular capsule. Um, it's kind of enjoying uh, renewed attention over the past couple of years um, because it's a nice sonic alternative to what everyone had too many of, which was the, the K67. And uh, it has a bump in the upper mids, right around, right around 4 or 5K, right where the red line protrudes up there. And what's interesting about that is that our ears are really sensitive in that same range. Okay, so we perceive that sound as, um, as, as, as presence. And sometimes it can be too much and it'll come across as a, as a sort of colored or unnatural sound, but sometimes it brings just the right amount of body to an instrument uh, in particular. So um, for drum overheads, as an example, uh, when you're recording drum overheads with a microphone that has that capsule in it, what you hear is that the symbols aren't exaggerated. Why not? Well, look at how the red line falls off, okay? It's got a diminished response at 10K and above. In fact, it's darker than all the rest of these at that point. So where the symbols could be too exaggerated, too bright, too harsh, um, this microphone is turning them down naturally. So I hear from a lot of engineers, especially for the drummers who come in and are just kind of bashing the cymbals, and then they play a drum fill, and it's like tap, 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 and then they're back on the cymbals like this. Well, a microphone like this kind of helps mix that premix that in a sense, right? Because it turns down the cymbals, but brings out the body of the drums. So it does some of the mix work for you.